pick up the thread when we come to share the word, but let's read from verse 15. Let those of us who are mature be thus minded. And if in anything you are otherwise minded, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brethren, join in imitating me, and mark those who so live as you have an example in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is the belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set upon earthly things. But our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. Amen and thanks be to God. Let's sing now a hymn. We are now in the middle of a passage which is fairly typical of Paul's writing where there are so many things bound together in such tight cordage that to separate them is almost to lose their strength. And uh, yet we need to in order to allow these things to be applied in some order and depth to our lives. So forgive me if I begin by giving you some titles to identify the three things that are before us in these seven verses tonight. Uh, they are, first of all, uh, a word about Christian maturity. Now, the word he uses for maturity is used elsewhere in this chapter and is translated as perfection, but it's not perfection in the sense of personal perfection or perfectionism. He is speaking about Christian maturity, and verse 15 does well to translate it in that way. So first of all, we have Christian maturity. That's the first strand. The second strand is a note of warning. And you find that in verses 18 and 19. And then Paul ends with the third strand, that uh, great purple passage of two verses, 20 and 21, verses so often used in the funeral services of those who have known and loved Christ where he speaks of citizenship of heaven. Christian maturity, then a warning, then something of the citizenship of heaven. Now, these titles, I confess, are hardly adequate. They could hardly be adequate for the richness of the paragraph. But as I said, we need to do something in order to pull the strands apart before we bring them together again. So shall we look at Christian maturity first of all? Now, it's not hard to see in these three verses, 15, 16, and 17, indeed it's not hard to see through the whole of this argument, another call for unity. What he is saying, you see, is that the mature should share this view of the Christian life. What's he been speaking about? He's been speaking about counting everything as loss for the sake of Christ. He's been offering himself and his way as a personal example of how to follow Christ more closely and so know him and the power of his resurrection. The mature, now Paul says, should share this view of living for Christ. Now there's unity in that. And the implication is that we should all unite in following this example, the example of counting everything we once thought were our benefits and our privileges and our blessings as loss. Loss, that is, when set beside the surpassing worth of knowing Christ and the wonder of knowing the power of that resurrection. 
which is his and his gift to us. Forgetting the past, press on. There's an implication all the way through of our unity. Now, two things are beginning to emerge. The first is this, that Paul has been describing the Christian life in terms of progress. Has he not? I press on. He is describing living for Christ as a matter of progress. Now, it's not just the progress of moving on, but moving inside, that is, of growing as human beings, as gro- of growing as Christians. Now, the growth he is describing is a growth towards maturity, that is, towards the perfection of which he's already spoken. But his point will always be that this perfection at which we aim, towards which we strive, is not achievable in this life. And by that I mean not completely, fully achievable in this life. Now, there will never come a time in the Christian life where you, or I, or any other believer reaches the point at which we have exhausted the potential for growth and progress. Never. Indeed, you know, I would have to go much further than that, would you not? And say that if you have to think of eternity in terms of endless time, which that's not at all what it is, But if you were, then you could spend eternity progressing onwards into the depths of the love of God and the knowledge of Christ and you would never come to an end. In fact, the deeper you were to go, the deeper you would see there is yet to go. The deeper you go, the deeper you understand there is to go. So perfection is not something that Paul would ever say can be achieved in this life, yet we press on. I know that needs a bit of um, nailing down into the text of Scripture, but we'll come to that in a moment. That's the first thing that's beginning to emerge. The second thing that is now beginning to come out in his writing is that what he has been saying about growth and progress is, progress is set against a background of some disagreement. In verse 15, as you see, he speaks about those who think differently. And this is something which Paul rightly regards as unworthy and distracting. Although he doesn't necessarily set these people who think differently beside those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Although the one can lead into the other. Now, what is it then that some people in Philippi, in the Macedonian churches, what is it over which they had a different mind? What was it over which they disagreed with Paul? Now the answer is there again on the page of Scripture. Because the answer lies just beneath the text, just behind what Paul is saying. Now what has he been saying? That he, Paul, like all Christians, will spend his life here on earth pressing on towards perfection always taking hold of that for which Christ took hold of him. Now, of course, as in Romans and as in his letter to the Galatians, Paul is prepared to say that we are once and for all dead to ourselves and to sin through the death of Christ, that we are therefore in the resurrection of Christ alive again and newly alive to God. But even although we are dead to self and sin and alive to God, we must yet press on towards that maturity which God desires for us. We must all seek to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us in love and mercy. We are pressing on towards a perfection, towards a maturity, Changed from glory into glory, Wesley says in the hymn. And he's got it right. Although, perhaps not John, but certainly Charles Wesley knew that there was no full, perfect glory in this life. Pressing on towards perfection and maturity, which will only be reached fully and finally when we are free, not only from the power of sin, which we are in Christ, 
not only from the penalty of sin, which we are freed from in his death, but actually from the presence of sin when we live in the presence of Christ eternally. Press on. Now, it's that then that he has been speaking of. Some people, it would seem, were disagreeing with Paul. Disagreeing, I think, not in so much as they said that there was no such thing as perfection. Not that they disagreed that there was such a thing as Christian completeness or maturity. But that they believed that was achievable fully here and now in this life. That personal perfection, perfection in the Christian life was possible as a second stage of the Christian gospel here and now. Now that is not what the Bible teaches. Although the Bible teaches clearly that the perfect offering of the death of Jesus Christ offers us a perfect ransom and forgiveness. I don't know about you, but I always find it quite breathtaking to see and to see again how the warnings in Scripture, not only New Testament but Old Testament, are so relevant and contemporary. This is something that we have to face today. Because there is a neo-perfectionism. And perfectionism the teaching of a system of belief which says that there is a second stage to Christian things that leads you into the state of maturity is a menace to the Christian life. Now, it appears through history. It has appeared in many, many forms. But whenever and wherever it appears, it is a menace and a stumbling block and has led to deep discouragement for many believers. In recent years, this has appeared again as a kind of two-stage Christianity. The first stage is our redemption. When we come to Christ and realize that in his love he has laid hold upon us, and we yield to him, to his lordship and receive the blessings of his salvation. But then they say there is a second stage where we are made perfect, or when we are made holy. Now whether you see this in some of the early days of Methodism, or whether you see it around you today, wherever you are presented with a system of two-part Christianity, you are being presented with something that is simply wrong. It is not biblical. It is certainly not what the New Testament teaches. And you know, one of the tragic things is to look back at those people, think of Edward Irving, for example, who believed this and taught this to others and then believed that other people actually achieved it but never had it for themselves and died broken-hearted. I don't know of any more sad story than the story of Edward Irving on his deathbed. I think it was a friend of his, wasn't it? Who knowing that all his life he had believed in the apostolic gift of tongues being relevant to the church today, listened to his friend mumbling on his deathbed and thought, at last he has tongues. And Edward Irving was actually reciting the 23rd Psalm in Hebrew. Oh, Edward Irving, would it not have been better to know the Good Shepherd in that personal way all through your life than to seek that which is an illusion? And I don't mean tongues. I mean the second stage of a two-stage Christianity. Now, this is something I really have to bring to you. I believe that whenever or by whoever you hear an offer of a distinct system of a second stage experience or a second stage dimension to the Christian life, you really should not believe it. I believe you should positively see that it is to be rejected. 
Now that needs a little bit of explanation. Of course there are many dimensions to our salvation. And of course there are many experiences of grace, of a kind of opening of the windows of heaven and a sudden understanding of something new. And it's, it's as if we started all over again. Of course, there are many experiences like this, and many have experienced such things. We're not arguing with that. But where you are presented with a system, a theology, or a doctrine of salvation as one stage, and then you must have a second stage, which is sanctification, or complete holiness, or perfection, or whatever it is called, you are being offered something that is not there. Now again, of course, in the death of Christ and its blessings for you, there may be many times when suddenly you discover a new application. Perhaps it's something you've never seen before, or perhaps it is something that's been there all the time and yet you've been blind to it. There are many examples of experiences of great blessing that come after conversion. But there are also many examples of third experiences and fourth experiences and many, many more. I'm saying to you, though, that everything is there from the beginning. Now, that is the burden of what Paul is saying in the face of Judaizers here, that you have everything in Christ. You do not need circumcision as a sign of the covenant. That covenant has gone in any case. There is a new covenant. It is one covenant. The covenant of grace. Now if what we have said thus far in Philippians, what we see in the text thus far in Philippians is true, that to add anything as necessary to what Christ has done is to take away from Christ. Then to speak of a second stage that comes in addition to the receiving of what Christ has done for us once and for all is to take away from Christ and to deny the effectiveness of his death and resurrection. It is to deny and to restrict the power of his resurrection that we read of in verse 11 of this same chapter. And in the same way, sanctification is something which goes on in our lives as a process of uncovering and applying the power of the gospel to our lives. And there may be great experiences of blessing, new beginnings for us. But there is no system of new beginnings. There is no doctrine of a two-stage Christianity to be found in Scripture. You've got to put it there. You've got to impose it on what's in the page. We have everything in Christ. Everything God has to give us is ours in Christ. And I often think that the gift of Christ to us is like giving a wonderful gift to a child who in receiving it in their early years, understands it in one way and enjoys it and is thrilled by it. But then as they get older and they begin to develop, they see that the gift has more functions. And as they get older again, yet more functions. They see more applications, more use, until you find a child retaining one childhood gift that they've had all these years. And it's even more precious to them as an adult than it was as a child. Now, whether that's a good figure or not, you see what I'm saying. It's all in Christ. It's all achieved. It is finished. It is complete. It is perfect in Christ. And while we must aim at maturity and completeness, and while we go on into a life of holiness and seek to live righteous lives for God, in obedience to God, this is something we will always be doing as we apply that which God has given us to the time God allows us. You see, this word is the word that trips people. The word that's translated mature uh, here in verse 15, but quite 
properly. The cognate word in verse 12, as you saw, is translated as perfection, or being perfected. But it never means an absolute personal perfection in our Christian lives here. Now Paul is urging a pressing on towards that. He is urging us to make progress towards maturity, always onwards towards completeness and the perfection which is ours in Christ. This is the mark of the genuine Christian, that receiving Christ they press on in obedience. And while absolute perfection here and now is impossible, read the letter of John and see. While sinlessness in this life is impossible, that complete freedom from sin and its penalty and its power is something we go on applying. Thanks be to God, day by day as Christians, we have a perfect Savior. Therefore, we have a perfect salvation. We are to press on. We are to make real what is real. We are to apply what has been given. We are to use that which is ours in Christ. We are to see its many dimensions. We are to experience its many blessings. But it will always be a matter of there is more. There is more. There is more. This is the way that you really ought, I think, to understand 1 Corinthians 13 where having spoken about the love of God the love that never ceases, never ends Paul then turns from experiencing that now to experiencing it then that is from experiencing it in this life to that which shall be when we are fully citizens in heaven what does he say? well love never fails prophecies will pass away tongues will cease Knowledge will pass away because our knowledge is imperfect. Our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, now it's the same word, telaios. When the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. Now, it would be obtuse, it would be so thrown and pig-headed of us to say, well, Paul here must be speaking about an experience in this life when the perfect, when perfection comes. Do you really think so? Do you think that when he says, now we see through our glass darkly, then we will see face to face, he means maybe next month we'll see face to face here on earth? I think it's so obtuse, it's almost crazy to believe that. He's speaking about what is yet to come and will be when we enter into the presence of God. That's why he says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, he's not speaking about that as a process. He's using that as an example. Maturing, the physical maturation, the emotional maturation of a human being as a picture of what is to come. And then he says this, Now... Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then, face to face. Now I know in part, my knowledge is partial. Then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. Perfection, in other words, is that which is yet to come and Nevertheless, is something we aim at day by day by day in our walk with Christ. Now that is the thing, surely, with which these people disagreed. Perfection is possible here. There is a second stage that comes after conversion. And we all must have it. Nonsense. Everything God has to give is ours. In the Beloved. In Christ. And while we may never allow that grace to grow in us and never grow up and be mature, while we may refuse the blessings of the Christian life or get stuck, nevertheless, every Christian has everything. Every Christian has Christ and therefore has everything. It's like having a huge oak tree in a seed. It's all there. It's all there from the beginning. 
Let it grow, Paul says. Mature, Paul says. Press on. Lay hold upon that for which Christ has laid hold upon you. And you see, the alternative so often is a matter of pride and arrogance. That's what happens, that those who think that they have something superior to others think that they have a perfection that somehow raises them and sets them above the imperfect. Now Paul will not even contemplate that here. Elsewhere he will. Elsewhere he contradicts it. Elsewhere he confronts such pride. Think of 1 Corinthians. But here he won't even think about it. He will not discuss it. And there are times, you know, when I think that should be our attitude, when faced by Christians who claim to have Christ plus something else. Something that is necessary. What others don't have. I think sometimes that ought to be our attitude. Nothing to do with it. You see, what happens is that Paul takes this and he sets down for us a lightning rod uh, in, in verse 16. A lightning rod that earths everything. Only, he says, let us hold true to what we have attained. Now, there's something that earths all high-flying talk of perfectionism. It's as if Paul says, oh yes, uh huh. you disagree with pressing on. Well, let me ask you, are you living in obedience to Christ now? Are you actually making full use of that which you already understand? And it is amazing how those who claim great experiences and wonderful gifts today show very little sign of this quality of down-to-earth obedience and when called upon when challenged in terms of verse 16 to express their love to Christ in terms of dogged faithfulness and everyday obedience they decline on the grounds that they have higher things to do no says Paul let's see you live up to what you've already attained or claim that you have attained and the question is asked of us, is it not? Are we holding true to what we have attained thus far? Now what happens is that Paul provides a bridge into the rest of his argument, into the warning he's about to give. Verse 16 moves onwards into 17 like this. Paul is going to speak of those who are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. And there's a clarity about this which is quite wonderful. He's been speaking, remember, in verse 13 about a thing revealed. He's been using, remember, before that, verses 13 and 14 and previously, but he's been using himself as an example of counting everything lost for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Here is my example. Here is the pattern of the apostles that we gave you. He says, imitate us. Because to imitate the apostles is to imitate Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, Be imitators of me, and then qualifies it by saying, As I am of Christ. And that leads him into this second part, the solemn warning. Christian maturity. And then verses 18 and 19, a warning. And it's a warning about being misled or led into another pattern. Not the pattern of living for Christ and aiming at maturity and counting everything lost for the sake of knowing him, but the pattern of moving from indifference to disobedience and to living as enemies of the cross. Now there's something, you know, that you really have to get a firm hold of here to understand what Paul is saying and it's this that he is most definitely speaking about Christians he can only be speaking about Christians he is still addressing those who are backslidden take verse 18 for example where he speaks of tears now only Christians can hurt other Christians like this only Christians who fall away who make a shipwreck of their lives, who ruin their testimony, or 
who wander so far in disobedience to Christ as to turn on his people. Only Christians can discourage others like this. We shouldn't be discouraged when those who have never come to a knowledge of Christ turn away in misunderstanding or ignorance. But those who turn away in disobedience can hurt others. Now maybe he's not speaking always of those who are as an extreme in their disobedience as he does here. But yes, Christians can dishearten us. And the key to this passage is found in the word live. Verse 16, let me show you how it goes. Verse 16 states how we should live. Attaining that which we have. Applying that which we have attained. Verse 16 states how we should live. Verse 17 shows us how the faithful Christians do live. And then verse 18, how backslidden, disobedient Christians have come to live or chosen to live. Now, the word is in every verse. I know that the RSV doesn't translate it so. But if you've got the authorized version or another translation, it'll probably be there. The word is not literally live at all. It's walk. And yet there are two words for walk here. Verse 16 speaks of walking in line. Now that's a reference to an orderly life, a life of harmony and unity, the life in the Spirit. While verses 17 and 18 speak of the whole round of life, everything, our lives. So it's how we should walk, live. How faithful Christians do walk or live. And how backslidden and disobedient Christians have chosen to live, to walk. And you'll notice that it's a daily thing. It's a matter of order and daily obedience to God in Christ. It's a matter of service. It's that which makes us distinct. All these thoughts are here in these three verses. Now what's he speaking against? Is he only speaking against the Judaizers, those who added circumcision and said you must have something else? No, I don't think he is. I think he's speaking now to a wide audience. I think he's addressing all who say that they are Christians, but whose daily walk, whose daily lives seem to deny their claim. Paul, all through his ministry, it is clear, fought against those who took the gospel of salvation by grace through faith and used it as an excuse for living any old how. Now there's something that's with us today. We give it the big name antinomianism, those who are against the law, Is grace then an excuse to do what you like so that as you sin more, grace abounds more, he asks the Romans? Not at all. God forbid, he says. But there are those who say they are Christians and then live so that their walk denies their claim. And here's another solemn warning that what we say should be matched by what we do and what we do should bear testimony to the truth of what we say. Otherwise, Paul goes on to say, we are living as enemies of the cross. Christian maturity, a warning about our daily lives, and finally, citizenship of heaven. Now there's a contrast here and it's that contrast that takes the three strands we have separated tonight and brings them together and weaves them once more into one strong cord. Citizenship of heaven is set before us now as a contrast. Citizenship of heaven is something that belongs to everyone who follows the narrow path of obedience to Christ. The way of life, as Christ calls it. Who follow his pattern. Who follow his example. And his example through the apostles. Who walk in this way. Verses 16, 17 and 18. 
Here is the contrast with those who have turned to apostasy and are living as enemies of the cross. They have their minds, says Paul, on earthly things. Not necessarily wrong things, but their minds are full of earthly things. And Christians who press on to maturity have their minds set on heavenly things. They are citizens of heaven. They are citizens of heaven in Christ who will return in the glory of his kingdom to bring the power of his resurrection to bear on all creation. Now never mind what you may have read about Christians who are so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly use. That's not true. In the real biblical sense, the more a Christian is heavenly minded, the more use he is on earth, or she is on earth. The more your mind is set upon your citizenship of heaven, the more you are prepared to give on this earth in this life. What is it that made great men like Livingston give their lives so sacrificially to something which on a human level seemed to achieve so little. One convert. What causes men and women to give themselves sacrificially if it's not that they have an eye to heaven and a heart for men and women on earth? Do you remember in Acts chapter 17 in its Macedonia, the other Macedonian church, Thessalonica, where Jason and the Christians were dragged up before the authorities and what was the accusation against them? These men are not good Roman citizens. They believe in another king. They call him Jesus. They have another citizenship. You know, there should come a time where in one way or another those around us recognize that we are foreign that we don't belong that while we are involved and given to people here on earth and while like Christians under communism they made the best actual communists actual communists we don't belong like them we don't belong We have another king. We are a colony of heaven. From which, says Paul, we await a saviour. A saviour. We think the language of salvation is the language exclusively of the New Testament. We are so wrong. You know, there's a suggestion of sovereignty in his mention of salvation here. And here we have a saviour king but a servant king. Do you remember in chapter 2 the way he spoke of the one who had all power and authority but humbled himself for us? We are citizenship. We are citizens of another kingdom. That kingdom is the place where ultimately we will have the perfection at which we aim every day and for which we strive and work. And every citizen of that kingdom has the assurance of resurrection life for all who believe. Because all power in heaven and on earth is given to Christ. Therefore he is able to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul speaks elsewhere, doesn't he, of Christ being formed in us, born in us. Is Christ taking shape in us? It's it's very suggestive that when he speaks here of lowly bodies, he uses the same language that he used in chapter 2 to describe the lowliness of Jesus Christ. His humbling. Our humble bodies. Is Christ being formed in us? Please don't take away from tonight's passage 
any thought that all you've been offered is a condemnation of perfectionism. What I set before you now is what the Bible sets down. Here is perfection. Christ formed in us. Pressing on towards maturity, knowing the power of his resurrection, is allowing Christ to be formed in us, that we might be transformed until that day when our very bodies, the dust of these bodies, shall be by his power transformed and like his glorious resurrection body. But the question for now is, is Christ being formed in us? Are we living out what we have learned? Are we living according to the pattern that Christ is and has given us? Because that is growth towards perfection. Because that is Christian maturity. Amen.